They came in with officers. Our kids were scared. You know, they come in with a piece of paper and say, you're giving us your kids. And it's like, you know, how can they just come in and do that? She said, you could be arrested for medical neglect. And I said, but how was that when, you know, this is my child. And I, and I see that he doesn't need that much medication. Why would you threaten me with something like that? At 10 p.m., two policemen and two social workers came to my house and took all four of my kids away. Once committed to psychiatric hospitals, patients are drugged and restrained. The more a person objects, the more this objection is construed as symptom of a mental illness. At which point the person would be locked up in restraints. There would be the ankle, the knee, the waist, the head, the wrist, and the shoulder restraints. And if when that process was happening, if there was almost any resistance at all, the person then would be medicated to a point where they would, be, they would almost be knocked out. We had one case where they actually took a patient in a seclusion room and beat him up. Then uh, they lied about it to the uh, services that investigated. So it's a pretty wide range of, of abuse issues that we've encountered. Psychiatric staff provoke their patients into violence so they can bill insurance companies up to $1,600 a day for each restrained patient. The patient would resist diagnosis, resist treatment, and also want to leave treatment while they were at the hospital. And invariably, every time, that person's situation would be exacerbated until they were put in constraints and medicated, at which point there would be documented reasons to keep that person in treatment. The burden of such claims is passed directly to the public in the form of soaring health care premiums. As for their victims, the experience is traumatic and even lethal. 16-year-old Rochelle Claiborne died in Laurel Ridge's care last August. The state report shows during the restraint, quote, Rochelle stated several times she could not breathe. In almost all respects, the, sta the staff uh, behaved appropriately, followed the standards. By taking advantage of weak or vague restraint laws, psychiatrists and their staff are almost never held criminally liable for assault, battery, and murder. He begged me to take him home, take him out of there, that they were treating him wrongly, and um, he didn't want to stay there. And I got a call that there had been an accident, that they held him down until he couldn't breathe anymore. I wish I would have listened to him, take him out of there before it had happened, and that I miss him every day. And I wish I could have him back, but I can't. To this day, no one has been charged for the child's murder. The elderly are a prime target for psychiatric abuse, with treatment of senior citizens in mental institutions costing private and government insurance over $29 billion a year unwarranted commitment has occurred that wouldn't have occurred if the people hadn't had insurance. The proof of that pudding is generally in how fast they get out once the insurance runs out. Involuntary commitment is a form of psychiatric slavery where persons are treated as if they're property and they are deprived of liberty and people are making money in the process. As long as we have involuntary mental hospitalization, psychiatry is a prison work. It's a crime against humanity, it is not medicine. Every minute of every day, someone is involuntarily committed to a psychiatric institution. And if you think this is something that can't happen to you or someone you know, think again. Every 75 seconds, someone in America has been committed against their will. And with over a trillion dollars allocated to U.S. hospitals since 1965, psychiatrists have carved out for themselves a lucrative commercial enterprise hidden behind a dubious interpretation of the law but all too often psychiatrists commit crimes too blatant to be ignored the FBI has raided the headquarters of one of the nation's largest operators of psychiatric hospitals Hundreds complained of overbilling, misdiagnosed conditions, and insurance fraud. Investigators say they found more than 5,000 similar cases in all 50 states. Psychiatrists clearly are getting rich. Psychiatrists traded drugs for sex, filed false insurance claims, and exploited patients sexually. We have uncovered some of the most elaborate, aggressive, creative, 
deceptive, immoral, and illegal schemes being used to fill empty hospital beds with insured and paying patients. Every psychiatrist takes an oath to follow an ethical code of conduct, to put the care of their patients above all else. But of all medical disciplines, psychiatry has the worst record of fraud and abuse. Psychiatry is almost a license to print money. If a doctor were clever enough, and many of them are, there's no reason that they couldn't make at least a half million dollars a year fraudulently and get away with it in psychiatry. I don't purport to have deposed every psychiatrist in Las Vegas. I can tell you for a fact I haven't. Maybe I've deposed half. And by and large, they were a dishonest, deceitful, lying bunch of people. So prevalent are their deceptive and criminal billing practices. Insurance investigators have slang for it, like the California wave and the $100 handshake. $100 handshake is when Usually a patient is uh, institutionalized. Psychiatrist, psychologist will visit that person, shake hands with them, say, hello, I'm doctor so-and-so, I'm taking care of your, your problem here, and then leaves. They might have 10 or 20 patients there. They bill an hour for each one, and they might be in the hospital for a total of 30 minutes. So 20 patients, 20 hours, and they'd send the bills off to Medicaid. We see that most of the victims of recovered memory therapy were women who had excellent health insurance, whether it was government insurance or private insurance, because many insurance policies wouldn't pay for this kind of long-term nonsense. So those people were targeted because of the nature of the insurance that they had. Every year, the U.S. psychiatric industry defrauds government and private insurance of $40 billion, using any means possible to deceive the public. There were some advertisements very seductive advertisements for people wanting to lose weight and were having problems losing weight. And they would be given, you know, all expenses paid to go to a particular spa. But when they got to this spa and went in and signed in, it wasn't a spa, it was a psychiatric center. And then they couldn't get out. What instead they received is they received massive doses of mind-altering drugs and they were kept for a lengthy period of time and their their insurance carrier was billed tremendous amounts of uh, money for something that was unnecessary. But their lies go beyond the psych ward and into the courts, where as paid witnesses, they will say anything to collect their fee. A psychiatric expert who will have one opinion in one scenario and a completely opposite opinion in another scenario based on which law firm or governmental agency is paying for his time. The psychiatrist on one hand will tell the public that suicide can, can be prevented, but will go into court and tell a jury that suicide cannot be prevented. And then once you show his prior inconsistent statements, you also show that he is paid very well by pharmaceuticals, then the jury says, you know what? We're not so sure about you. Um, because you just lied to us. Add to the greed, dishonesty, and avarice their sex crimes. Accounting for only 6% of the physicians in the country, psychiatrists commit one-third of the sex-related offenses committed by doctors. It has happened so often that by the mid-80s, the insurance companies who insure physicians across America started writing sexual claims out of the policies altogether. That's how common it was. The system was so broken that more than 25,000 complaints had been registered, but nothing acted upon. When a psychiatrist has a patient, a female patient, and abuses them sexually, there's a very high probability they'll get away with it. I've seen many cases where the mental health professional becomes very disturbed and is using very strange and odd treatments and that can go on for many years with no one finding out about it because it's not very public, it's quite private. Things happen behind closed doors. 
Tragically, their sex crimes often involve children. Case in point, Dr. C. Markham Berry. On the surface, a well-respected member of his community. But all that shattered when he was arrested on child molestation charges. Van loads of child pornography were removed from his home, and the subsequent investigation uncovered his sexual abuse of former patients, boys aged 7 to 17, who he photographed and sodomized. All part of what the state called 50 years of Barry's rampant, undetected sexual escapades with children. This is not an isolated incident. It is the carefully masked character of the members of this profession. In every city, every state, every country, you'll find psychiatrists committing rape, sexual abuse, murder, and fraud. And as you will see, psychiatry's entire credibility depends on the biggest fraud of all. I was diagnosed with a chemical imbalance, manic depression. They diagnosed me with having ADD. He told me I had conduct disorder. ADHD. Mild depression. Major depression. Manic depressive. Borderline personality Obsessive. disorder. Compulsive Social disorder. Social anxiety. Depression and schizophrenia. ADHD. Sleep disorder. I think the problem is over. There's no such thing as mental disorder. A mental disorder is whatever someone says it is, and if the person saying this is a mental disorder has enough power and influence, then people believe, oh, that's a mental disorder. But you can't have power or influence without credibility, so psychiatry manufactures its own. It's based on a, a, a grab bag of checklists for disorders that are published in a book called the DSM, which is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. There are no statistics in this book, by the way. That just makes it sound more scientific. They create this cluster of disease, and they get together and they vote. Is this a disease? All in favor say aye. It's marketed as a scientifically based document. Now, the American Psychiatric Association, which publishes the DSM, do a lot of work to create an, an aura of scientific precision around the DSM, but it's not scientifically based. Since the first edition of the DSM, the number of mental disorders voted into psychiatry's diagnostic manual has grown to 374. And with each new disorder, psychiatrists create yet another way to defraud the public. If you have 27 ways to bill in the DSM, that's 27 ways to bill. If you have 300, that's 300 ways to bill. So you can pretty much find anyone walking on the street that could fit into a DSM somehow. When you build an insurance company, you can't say the word. You've got to send a number. And they have numbers for the most ridiculous things, you know, like arguing with your mother or peeing in the bed. Adolescent rebellion disorder is an official psychiatric diagnosis. Um, Arithmetic learning disorder is an official psychiatric diagnosis. General anxiety disorder is a recent diagnosis. For each one, there is a five-digit code with a decimal point. Now, the implication of that is if I have uh, illness 403.16, that that's different in some important and scientifically proven way from someone who has 403.17. And nothing could be further from the truth. Incredibly enough, while presenting the DSM to the world as scientific fact, psychiatrists freely admit its utter lack of science. We have no diagnostic reliable markers for almost any illness there is in the DSM. What we're testing for in psychiatry, it's, it's hard to say because there's nothing specifically. But as far as a test that's clinically useful, um, you know, basically we're not there yet. We don't have any laboratory tests that we can use to uh, determine whether somebody does or doesn't have a mental illness. There are no good biological tests for detecting mental illness. There is no test, there's no biopsy you can do. There is no chemical test right now. But there are no specific tests 
to confirm the diagnosis or show the improvement like any blood tests or any x-rays or anything like that? Oh, in my practice I don't do any tests. I just speak with people and uh, listen to them and then I make a decision in 